Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and uses the imaginary Airsatz Coffee Shop as its platform to bring you a conversation about a plethora of scintillating topics. We don't shy away from any issue that is plaguing our culture or the church today, whether it's current cultural issues, questions about Bible verses, or even just some banter to encourage you. Dr. Jay Christensen is the Truth Barista, and he and amazing Larry Kutzler brew up highly caffeinated conversations for our day. Grab a cup of joe, pop yourself down in the booth next to us, and get ready to think. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry, and it's listener-supported. For more information about The Truth Barista, go to highbeamministry.com. Thanks for listening. Prayer doesn't have to be complicated. We don't need to clean up our act, kneel in a certain position, or say the perfect words in order to get God's attention. Simply put, prayer is talking to God. It's like having a conversation with a friend. But this relationship wasn't made possible without the sacrifice of Jesus. When we surrender to Jesus, He serves as a mediator between us and God, interceding on our behalf. God created us to have a relationship and connection with Him. And so, He sent Jesus to make that connection possible. We are presenting God's truth for our day. You're listening to The Truth Barista, a production of HighBeamMinistry.com. Okay, Dr. J, I think we're going to talk about prayer today, and I'm glad we are because prayer is an important element in the Christian's life, and yet we often don't practice it like we should, right? That's right, and I think we should talk about prayer today specifically focused on our nation and our part in that. In fact, I heard an evangelist the other day make a very insightful comment, and it was this. It was after the uh, election, the midterm elections, and he was saying, you know, now that all of you have seen that that election, you were hoping for the red wave and it didn't come through. Well, now maybe instead of trusting in the ballot box, you'll actually start trusting God. Hmm. Good comment. (laughs) Wasn't that powerful? It was. And it's very interesting because I read this article just the other day about non-believers and it said that they have a distinctive response into a crisis. They always will pray, please God, you know, help me, help me. Perhaps it should be not surprising that a new survey found that one in five adults pray desperately saying they're not religious, but they pray. Isn't that interesting? They pray. But it seems like we pray more, whether we're Christian or not Christian, when we're in a crisis. Is that right? Well, exactly, because when we're in a crisis, we realize there's nothing we can do to help ourselves. And so we've got this instinctive drive to call out to something greater than us to help us. And it's probably reinforced with our childhood. You know, when we're little kids, our parents take care of us, right? When we're in trouble. Well, when we're adults, who do we call out to? Our heavenly parent, whether we know him personally or not. And that's part of that instinctive cry for help. Well, one New York Times author, journalist said this, It's the last resort of people, he's referring to prayer, who have run out of ideas and the first resort of people who never bother to think about how they could actually fix the problem at hand. I mean, that's so insane that he would say something like that, because when we're in a crisis, nine chances out of ten, we can't do anything about it. It's an impossible situation, so we reach out to the only being that could probably help us, and that's God. Prayer is a very important thing, so I don't know, New York Times journalists, wow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we should be praying at all times. In fact, that's what the Word tells us. We should be praying at all times and asking God for all things, because why? He wants to help us. That's what Jesus clearly told us. But the emphasis I want to get to today is the prayer in emergency times, prayer when things are desperate, and especially prayer for a nation that's in distress. So, talking about languages, when a ship goes down or it's in distress, the international distress signal goes out over all the channels. So, when the Titanic was sinking, it went out over all the radio waves it possibly could. And what's the international distress call? Do you know what that is? Well, it's May Day, May Day, May Day. I don't know why they're using the month of May as a distress call. Press the transmit button and say slowly and clearly, May Day, May Day, May Day. <laughs> exactly. Well, me being the curious kind of fella I am, I went online and did my searching, and I found out that May Day comes from the French phrase, Venez Mede, which means come help me. So if you say it fast, 
Vede Mede. Mede, Mede, Mayday. Ah. That's where it came from. Ah. So basically, the call is a French word for help. Help, 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 help. There you go. You learn something every time you tune in, don't you? Okay, anyway, Israel often found themselves calling out Mayday to the Lord in times of distress. You just read through any of Israel's ancient history, and oh my gosh, it's like every time you turn around, it's, Lord, help us, Lord, help us, Lord, help us. You know, there were only a few of those times the Lord refused to answer them. And it's interesting because it was of their sin that had been too great or their hearts weren't serious about repentance. And there are times when the Lord turned his back on them. Now, he didn't turn his back on them because he hated them. God loved his people. He was he didn't like their sin. He hated their sin. And so when he turned his back on his people, that was his way of of allowing them or kind of if you want to say cajoling or encouraging them no call out to be more because why the more you're calling out to me shows me the more your heart is turning to me and the more in distress you are the more you want to draw close to me so we see a lot of christians today calling out to god in prayer and yet it seems like our nation is getting worse and worse and worse maybe it's not because god hates us as some of the so-called prophets would say but maybe it's because god loves us and he's using our distress to draw us closer to him i want to explore that today our nation is in distress we have family issues right our economy is on the edge of collapsing right now. You just look at the economic prognosticators and they're saying, you know, you can only have so many trillions of dollar in debt before you completely collapse, right? 31 trillion. 31 trillion today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, I hate to tell you this, but we can't service the debt on $1 trillion. And we're looking at 30, what was that again? 30, that was 31 trillion dollars as of uh, this month. 31 trillion. Yeah. Uh well, now add to that crime. Crime is skyrocketing in not just cities, but in rural areas. We have an unresponsive and mostly corrupt leadership at so many levels, from federal all the way down to even the local levels. We need the Lord's help because, as we've said, at this point, we can't do anything. I was just thinking about this the other day. We look at the ballot box to be our solution, and yet you have an election, and you obviously see that there's cheating going on. And even if we do have regular elections that aren't filled with cheating, which is kind of an imaginary thing, but anyway, we still get the same corrupt leaders going back into office. And it's like, Lord, how are we ever going to be fixed? Because it's corrupt hearts that put corrupt leaders in office. Like the people once said, you get the leaders you deserve, or God gives a nation the leaders it deserves. And maybe we get the leaders we deserve because that's where our heart's at, and the leaders reflect the populace. And so we are in a state where maybe we shouldn't be praying for the leaders and trying to do something about them. Maybe we should be trying to do something about us instead. We need to be rescued and reset by God. So let's take a deep dive into it. I'm going to look at one particular scripture, but I want to start with a different one, okay? I think that's great. Can I make just a quick comment? I saw yeah. a movie years ago with Burt Reynolds. There's a movie clip where he gets thrown overboard in the middle of the ocean, or not in the middle of the ocean, but quite a ways from shore, and he's swimming in, and he's like, God, I'll give you everything I own. God, I'll, I'll serve you to the day I die. And all the way in, he's making this plea to God to just save him, because he's, you know, he's desperate. He's in a crisis. So he finally reaches the shore and he crawls up on shore and he goes, God, it's your fault I was in this mess anyway. I'm not giving you anything. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, isn't that true sometimes in crisis? We're quick to tell God, I'll do anything. But once the crisis lessens, then all of a sudden, well, eh, not so much. Well, you know, my dad has a very interesting phrase that I heard all my life growing up. As he said, you know something, you never really learn your lesson until you have that significant emotional experience. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes that significant emotional experience is getting whacked up the side of the head with a two by four. And that's when I look at God leaving us in distress. I think there's wisdom in that, that God allows us to be in places of distress to the point where we'll finally get that significant emotional experience and never do it again. Case in point. But look at Israel. Israel struggled with idolatry for hundreds and hundreds of years in ancient Israel through the time of the kings. What did God have to do to break idolatry in Israel? He said, 
You guys like idolatry? I'll give you idolatry, the likes of which you've never seen. And he allowed the Babylonians and the Assyrians to come in, womp on his people, and then exile them. Actually, what was left of Israel went to Babylon, the very seat of idolatry in the Fertile Crescent, in, in the whole Asia Mideast area. And for 70 years, they're parked in a nation that's swimming in idolatry. And finally, when they get back to the land, it's like, you know, we've had it with this idolatry stuff. We're not doing it anymore. And that broke idolatry in the land. I love that. I love that, Dr. J. And especially, I love God having a Brooklyn accent. That's precious. <laughs> I bet you didn't know that. Huh? That's right. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, let's get to the text here. Let's talk about the May Day, the distress call. Okay, we see that in Psalm 106, verses 44 through 45. It says here, but he, God, took note of their distress, that's Israel, when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant, and out of his great love, he relented. Now, this psalm is a confession of Israel's long history of rebellion, and it's also a record of their prayer for God to once again save his people. So, verse 6 says this, We have sinned, we have done wrong, and acted wickedly. And the rest of the psalm talks about that. This is what Psalm 106 says Israel did. They gave no thought. They did not remember. They soon forgot him. They did not wait for his counsel. They gave in to their cravings. They grew envious of others, of others resulting in open rebellion. They made a calf idol, and they forgot God. They despised God's gifts. They disbelieved and doubted God. They grumbled. They disobeyed. They provoked the Lord by turning away from him and serving other gods. They committed wicked deeds and rebelled against his spirit. They mingled with the nations and adopted their custom, shedding innocent blood through child sacrifice, defiling themselves by doing what was wrong. Now tell me, did I just describe ancient Israel or did I describe the United States? <laughs> wow, that is an indictment. Not only it ancient is. Israel, but you're absolutely right to current day America. It's absolutely stunning. It is spot on. Now, this psalm says the Lord delivered them repeatedly, but eventually he grew angry, and here it is, he turned away from them, handing them over to others who ruled over them, bringing, you know, oppression, a little subjugation, you know. So the question in my mind as I read through this is, I wonder if the United States is reaching that same point. Because if you look at the history, and we've talked about this in the past, and we, I think we should do it again, but Every nation, every kingdom, every empire gets to the point where they begin to slide downhill. They fall into decay. Not one of them has avoided that path. And toward the end of their decay period, other nations come in and start picking away at them until eventually that kingdom, empire, or nation falls. So I, I think in our arrogance, we think the United States shall always stand, for we are a Christian nation, except when we're totally unchristian and turn our backs from God, and all of a sudden we wonder why enemies might be parked on our borders, or enemies are within the gates, or we have leadership that's allied with our enemies and are trying to overthrow our nation. I mean, it just gets to that point. Why? Because of the decay of the people, not the leaders, the people that put the leaders into place. So again, who says we're invincible? Will the Lord turn us over to, to foreign financiers? or foreign troops, or foreign religions who will oppress and subjugate us. By the way, 9-11 isn't all that long ago. Will the Lord allow another terrorist attack with even worse consequences? When he lifts his hands, no nation is safe. Hey, just learn from Israel, right? Well, and I think the southern border, we hear a lot of the mess that's going on down there. And I think that's part of God's, I think, judgment. He's going to allow things to happen to our country that we aren't used to. And this is one. I mean, the, the borders are open. All kinds of stuff is coming in. Fentanyl, drugs, you know, just all kind of the wrong people in many cases. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting day we live in, for sure. Okay, so go to verses 44 through 45 okay. of 106, Psalm 1. Okay, the Lord heard them in their distress and he remembered their covenant. Now, we have a covenant in the United States. Did you know that? Well, I didn't know it, but you're going to tell me we did. 
<laughs> exactly right. When the pilgrims were on their way here, when they were offshore, now there's the Mayflower Compact. It was a covenant between the first settlers to serve God and to propagate the gospel. And it was also to be subjects of King Jimmy, but Jimmy's dead, so he's out of the compact. <laughs> it's just between God and us now. Some people say, well, that was the Mayflower Compact. That doesn't pertain to us as an official nation. Au contraire, Pierre, because if you check the 50 state constitutions, they openly and freely acknowledge in writing the Lord's sovereign hand in the affairs of every state. So if you look around at our society, there are many good people and good things. But if we have both officially and as a people have turned away from our covenant commitments, what do you think we should expect from God? Hmm? Silence. Exactly. Now, others have risen up to change the course of this nation, at least hoping to change it into their own non-God and anti-God, anti-Christian vision. But the Mayflower Compact and Covenant still remains binding on our nation as a foundational promise. But by the evidence of our stumbling society, God is taking our first covenant very seriously. So, what should we do, Amazing Larry? I think that God is the only one that gets us out of this mess. So we got to turn our back on the culture and what the culture dictates and our faces toward God. Yeah, I believe you're right, because there's nothing that we can do to fix this nation morally as an individual. I can try to preach. I can try to, you know, vote at the ballot box. I can try to marshal all sorts of support. And all those things aren't bad. And in many cases, they're good. But really, this is a heart issue. This is something that only... God can fix. And this is what he's been working a lot on my heart lately is he's been saying to me, yes, it's okay to be involved in these things, but the most important thing is to ask me for help. And so I started some studying here, and this is what I came up with, Second Chronicles 7.14. This is the first step back toward God. God always provides a way out of our sin and our troubles, and he provides a road back to him. This is what Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now we're going to break this down today and during our next study, okay? Okay. So here's our responsibility. God starts right off the top with it. If my people. Now, if is conditional. If the conditions are met, then something will happen. If the following conditions are met, as we read in Second Chronicles 7.14, then God will act. It's divided into two sections, the if and then. We can't force God to do anything, but if he has given us the conditions, then he has bound himself to act when those conditions are met. The issue isn't with him, the issue is with us. Us. U.S. United States people. Wow, that was pretty smooth there, Dr. <laughs> yeah, 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 kind of slim that run right in there. Wow. All kidding aside, it comes down to the individual. But imagine if all of the individuals in the United States, well, let's just put it this way. If all of the professed Christians in the United States turn back wholeheartedly to God, how that would change the nature of our nation. So, will we meet his conditions, and then will he act? And by the way, look at this, has always stuck out to me. The promise is directed only to God's people. The hard, cold truth is that the blame for our country's condition can be laid squarely at the feet of only one group of people, God's people. And I would even posit Jew and Gentile, because these scriptures are also written to the Jewish people. And since Christians are born again and filled with the Spirit, I would say that we Christians likely bear the greater responsibility. There's so much to say about how our nation has arrived at this place, but, you know, that's water under the bridge, right? So what can we do to see these things change? Here's the next part of the verse. Humble themselves. Now, biblically, this means fasting. And fasting is denying our own desires, agendas, plans, goals, you know, focusing on God alone. So why is this so powerful, Amazing Larry? Because it shows us where we went wrong and how to get back on track. Even as God's people, we're easily distracted by both the pleasures and the cares of life. How often have we allowed ourselves to lose the vision that the Lord has set before us? And as Proverbs says, 
where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. That's what it means. It doesn't mean they perish. It just means where there is no rule of God's law, the people are unrestrained. They go crazy. But happy is the person who keeps the law. In other words, the person is happy who follows God's ways. Look at the United States. How many people are happy? Not a lot, because according to recent surveys, a majority of people are on antidepressants. Mm. Okay, is that maybe attributable in part by the fact that we've walked away from God? Well, what's interesting, Pastor Jeffress from the First Baptist Church of Dallas, he has repeatedly said that the problems in America primarily start at the pulpit. But the fact is that the pulpit is not telling the kind of truth that comes out of the scripture that directly addresses some of the issues that our sin has created. Well, I agree, and I'll give you two perspectives. Number one, yes, what's preached in the pulpit is reached in the pew. And so you do need both of those. You need God's Word preached clearly in its entirety from the pulpits, boldly and without apology. However, the pastors can only go so far. It's the parishioner's responsibility to take God's Word and put it into action. Because if there is not a pastor in the pulpit, then the person in the pew can't say, well, I I don't have any responsibility to this. Uh, uh Uh-uh. Disciples are responsible to their master first and foremost, and that's not the preacher, it's Jesus. So that's what we should be going for, is putting the focus on the pew regardless of the pastor, but that doesn't give the pastors a pass. They need to step up and do their part in encouraging the congregation. So getting back to what we were talking about, you know, if we don't focus on God's ways, his commands, his directions, and yes, laws, okay, we easily succumb to ADD, any darn distraction, you know, and that leads us to unrestrained lives which are perishing. That's why humbling ourselves is the first condition, because humbling ourselves gets rid of those drives those desires you know we fast those things that distract us okay so we first we humble then we pray okay this is crying out to god this is not repeating mindless prayers this is not playing with beads this is not going through the liturgy in a hymn book this is not repeating worship choruses over and over and over again it is crying out to god talking to him communicating to him communicating with him asking begging pleading even demanding his action on our behalf Jesus himself, God himself, tells us to pray and not stop praying until we get an answer. For example, the widow before the morally corrupt judge. The point of Jesus' parable is this. He'll give in, this judge will give in to her because of her pestering him. So how much more will the absolutely righteous and just judge of the universe, the one who loves us with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, hear and act on behalf of his beloved ones? So we need to fulfill the second condition and pray, and then move on to the third condition, which is seek my face. Now again, this isn't literal, okay? This is a biblical idiom that means seeking God's whole being. In doing so, we're seeking his mind. Lord, what's your mind? His will. Lord, what's your will? His heart. Lord, what do you feel about this? His desires. What do you want to have happen? His favor. His presence in our situation. When we seek his face, we're looking for the depth of his being. And in doing so, we will be changed in return. We'll see how far aside we've turned, Amazing Larry, and how far away we've wandered, how unlike God we've become. It's the answer to humbling ourselves. It shows us the way back to the foundations that God established for us. So, can anyone say this nation is walking the righteous path God wants it to walk? Inspect the fruit of our national life. Is it sweet fruit or is it bitter? Is there holiness or unholiness? Is there life? Or do we push death? What's the main spirit of our nation? What do we display to the rest of the world? This is a really humbling and terrible thing to look at. Because frankly, you look at our legislation today, our legislation is funding abortions around the world. Legislation from our nation is funding homosexuality and transgender stuff around the world. It's bad enough that we do it in our states. It's bad enough we do it in our nation. But this nation is exporting idolatry, immorality, 
and the shedding of innocent blood. The United States is the main producer of pornography in the world, and we dare call ourselves a Christian nation? And yet we wonder, God, why are things so bad in our nation? This is a duh moment, you know? And I hate to kind of, you know, leave our, our episode on a downer note, but this should cause us to look at ourselves and to inspect where are we at and what should we do? And that's where we're going to pick it up the next time. Well, I sure appreciate it, Dr. J. It's not a downer. It's a warning. I think we need to be warned of our behavior, the things that are happening, and our silence. Our silence when these things are happening, we kind of, kind of pull into our cocoons, and it's just not the right place for Christians to be. We need to be outspoken on the immorality and the things that you've just mentioned. So until next week, I can't wait to hear more of the challenge that you have for us on prayer. Hey, Truth Barista Show listeners, this is Dr. J. Christensen, and I want to challenge you to take a deep dive into your Bibles this year. How? By reading through your Bible in 2023, and I want to help you. Cruising Through the Bible is High Beam Ministries' year-round Bible reading schedule and commentary. All you have to do is follow the schedule in the book and read a few chapters of the Bible every day. Then, check out my thoughts on the day's reading. Now, I get it. The Bible is often hard to understand because it's written for ancient and first century people, and we're only about 2,000 years removed from them. That's why I wrote Cruising Through the Bible, to help you understand what you're reading and to connect what you've read with the rest of the Bible and make God's Word a part of your life. So, take the challenge. You'll find Cruising Through the Bible on Amazon.com. Go to Amazon.com, search Cruising Through the Bible, and you'll find it in monthly installments for print or Kindle. No huge commitment, although as a follower of Jesus, you really should know his whole word. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. But, Dr. J, what if I miss the beginning? What if I miss a day? Well, that's the beauty of it. You can jump in anytime you want. Remember, God's Word is alive, and no matter what you read, even the tough or the weird-to-you part, God will still speak to you and into your life. So, take the Read Through the Bible in a Year Challenge, and let me help you. Go to Amazon.com, type in Cruisin' Through the Bible, and get started now. Oh, and coffee. Don't forget coffee. Coffee helps a lot. Okay, fine. Tea's good, too. So, just start cruising through the Bible today. Get High Beam Ministries Cruising Through the Bible on Amazon.com. the truth today? Dr. Jay Christensen is the truth barista and the founder of High Beam Ministry. Jay is a creative person who wants to use the setting of an imaginary cafe to produce a series of radio and internet programs that confront the issues of our day through the lens of the Bible. The Truth Barista was the avenue that was developed to communicate truth using the Bible as the source of our information. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and can be found online at highbeamministry.com.